Hello, good evening, everybody. Hi. Oh, come on, a bit more. Than... Hi. 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 That's great. Uh, thank you very much for coming out on uh, a fairly chilly and miserable Tuesday evening. This is a really, really special evening because this is the first public event in this new building. See, fantastic. So we are. Um, we are, whether you want to think of it as christening it or popping its cherry, I don't know. You, you do you. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Kat Arney. I am a science writer, a broadcaster. I'm the uh, founder and creative director of First Create the Media. We're a, a life sciences communications consultancy. And also my special connection here, probably the reason why I'm still here, is that I did my postdoc in the LMS with Mandy Fisher at the back. Um, I was the world's worst postdoc. Thank you, Mandy. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so it's really, really incredible to come back sort of 10 years later. And I've been involved in some of the, the art and science projects and writing projects that Mandy's done, public communication, for a very long time. And uh, it's really fantastic because the other thing that we are doing here today, we're not just celebrating uh, a wonderful new building, we are celebrating a wonderful new book. So hopefully you've managed to pick up your copy of this picture of health. It's an incredibly diverse, uh, eclectic collection of artistic meditations on the theme of health. It's got uh, contributions from everyone ranging from Sadiq Khan and Dame Sally Davis to uh, an anonymous Bangladeshi ship worker uh, talking about the, the health conditions affecting uh, them and their colleagues. And it's it's really absolutely beautiful. And can we just give a quick round of applause to all the team that made this happen because it is a fantastic project. Cheers. Cheers. So before the other thing I need to do before we go any further, I've got to do the health and safety. So, you know, your life jacket is under your seat. Um, the toilets, if you need them, are out by the lifts and kind of around there, around the corner by the lifts. Uh, this is a non-smoking site. Please no smoking in the building or on site. We are not expecting a fire alarm. If you hear a fire alarm, please exit via the signed evacuation routes there. Do not go down the main stairs in the atrium. I don't know what happens if you do, but I, this has been stressed to me several times. Do not go down the main stairs. Um, please follow the instructions of the fire wardens. They'll be wearing very jazzy yellow high-vis jackets. Um, proceed to the assembly point, which is at the east end of the Burlington Danes building, which I believe is just around the corner over there. If you're feeling unwell, please let one of the, uh, the team know, contact a member of staff. Uh, we do have some disposable face masks, if anyone feels lucky. Um, and we also do advise against travelling back home via East Acton Station. It's good to know some things don't change in 10 years. Uh, if you are catching the Central Line, please do go via White City, and you can also get to the Hammersmith City and the Circle Line around there. It's dodgy as hell when I lived here. It's still dodgy as hell. Um, so we are, uh, what else have I got to do? So we've introduced the book. Um, if you are on social media, please do use the hashtag, hashtag picture of health. If you'd like to take photos, if you'd like to take pictures of the exhibition and tweet about the event or, or post it onto your social media channels. And uh, this evening we're going to have quite a lot of activity. So we're going to start with panel discussion. We have a very illustrious scientific panel here. We're going to talk about the future of health and the future of health research. Then we are going to have a break for some poetry. We're going to have a chance to look around the exhibition. If you're feeling very creative, you're going to have a chance to do a bit of uh, crafting, if that's your thing. Uh, we'll also be seeing another video from a fantastic theatre group. Then we'll be having a discussion about, you know, what does health mean to us, a healthy world? So that sort of healthy future from a different perspective. And in the middle, there will be a chance to get some more drinks, to mingle, meet people, have a few snacks. Uh, and then hopefully we should be wrapping up by nine if I've done my job properly. So our first panel, I am very thrilled to welcome. So to discuss the topic of the future of health, we have, as far as we have, Professor Semeni Pangalos. He's Executive Vice President of Biopharmaceuticals R&D at AstraZeneca, with overall responsibility for the company's kind of pharma discovery and uh, early development. So, big job. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> um, I mean, it really is a linchpin of the AstraZeneca's research, and it's also, you oversaw the creation of the fantastic building in Cambridge. So, last year they opened a, a really fabulous new research centre, which is, is very, very cool. Not up and running like this one is, though. <laughs> So Little yeah, anyone who's again. moved into a new lab, um, you can go and sympathise with, uh, with many about that. We're also joined by Irene Miguel Aliaga. She is a group leader here at the LMS, Professor of Genetics and Physiology at Imperial College London. And uh, according to the biography I have, has an interest in the idiosyncrasies 
of adult organs. So mm -hmm. why our bits are weird <laughs> and how they differ between males and females and how they change on our diet, our internal state, what's going on around us, and particularly focusing on the crosstalk between the brain and the gut. And then we're also joined by Aldo Faisal. He is Professor of AI in Neuroscience at the Department of Bioengineering, the Department of Computing at Imperial College, where he leads the Brain and Behaviour Lab. So if you're addicted to your phone, you could probably ask him why. <laughs> um, can you answer that? Okay, cool. Yeah. Ask him why. Um, and uh, you are, he and his team are pursuing both basic science and translational work by reverse engineering the algorithms that drive brains and behaviour, translating this into technology that helps people. So I guess that the first question, and we'll kind of go, I guess we'll start from many and go this way, is what do you see as the key health challenges that we are facing? And whether you want to take that to you know, the, the UK or, or the wider world, where do you see as a, the key place we should be focusing our attention when we're thinking about health? That's a, that's a very broad big question. Big one, off you go. I mean, you're the big cheese. This is the big question. The big cheese. Um, so I'll start with, so globally, I think, I think there's still lots of unmedical need, lots of, lot, very high unmedical need across a, a variety of disease, whether you're interested in neuroscience or GI disorders or cancer. We've made tremendous progress, but there's still a lot of areas where um, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, obviously, but, are the mics on? Hold on a second. Is that better there? There we go. Hold on. They're not very powerful. I'm going to move this up. Is that better? Can you move better now? Okay, there we go. So there is still many areas of high medical need where there's still a lot of progress to be made, but I think we have made tremendous progress over the last decade, and actually the COVID pandemic probably exemplifies the power of life sciences, um, research and development, and ultimately the impact that, um, that, that, that R&D physicians and, and the health system can have on, on our societies around the world. There's still a lot of health inequality. We can talk about that. Uh, I think in, in the UK, the, the biggest challenges specifically are creating an environment that encourages people to invest in life sciences and R&D, turn the, um, the sciences, the, the fantastic science we have in our universities all around the UK, to create an environment where those can be translated into startups, biotech companies that stay in the UK versus uh, you know, emigrate to the US or other countries where potentially there's what is perceived to be a, a, a more attractive um, investment environment. And then when new medicines come, creating an environment where it's easy for physicians to use those medicines, to get access to them, um, and where we have an environment where new drugs are used quickly in the NHS and, and by physicians versus um, being one, which is what, unfortunately not what happens today. We, often we're one of the last countries to use innovation, uh, even if you compare countries with similar GDPs in Europe or uh, other regions. And so I think an environment where when new medicines are approved, they're actually used because if they're not used, then what tends to happen is clinical care becomes not at the cutting edge, which then means that clinical trials are not at the cutting edge, which then means the applied science is not at the cutting edge, which feed back, feeds backwards, unfortunately, into research as well. So in an, an environment where I think it's good for investment in life sciences and R&D. We'll definitely come back to that towards the end. Um, Irene, for you, as uh, more on the, the early research end, and as someone here in the, the Institute of Medical Sciences, more in the, the laboratory side, what do you see as the, the kind of main health challenges that we're facing? Yeah, I think from my perspective, I think I would agree with, um, with, with many. I think one of, the, one of the challenges, especially for the UK at the moment, is to create the kind of right environment in which sort of outside the box discoveries can be you know, seamlessly translated. Um, and, and, you know, that's not necessarily always a straightforward translation path in which you do, you know, one amazing finding in a sort of niche um, model organism and then you take it to another model organism and eventually you take it to humans. I think it involves a lot of iteration between different um, disciplines, between different kind of mindsets. And for that, we need to be able to attract and retain the best minds. Um, in the UK, and that is currently quite challenging mm. because of Brexit and because of many other, um, because of you know many the current sort of climate um, in some ways that's sort of beyond our control. So I think I think that's a challenge really to sort of create these or and maintain these creative and 
and sort of outside the box environment that we, we used to have and I think we've had and, and I think it's led to really amazing discoveries that we can do How about you, Aldo? You're in a field that's you know very exciting, data, AI, you know, mm. everything's fine, right? <laughs> it's, it's it's wonderful. Um I, I think I think what we have in terms of data and healthcare data in the UK is a globally unique situation because we have one NHS, if we can keep it, and that provides us with an unprecedented level of professional expertise combined with a population-wide availability of insights and data that you find in this form and at this scale nowhere else in the world. You'll find it in Israel a bit and in some of the Baltic countries, but not at the scale of, of the population of the UK. And due to various historical wise decisions, we have ways of harnessing this data and from you know collecting hospital-wide data, we have now London-wide data sets with millions of electronic healthcare records that allow us to understand science at a different level. It's also a different way of doing science. You don't go from the micro to the macro, you go from the macro to the micro, the other way around. And I think we have unique opportunities, therefore, that other countries will envy us. And it's about harnessing these means and ways of basically being able to tackle some of the challenges that were raised, healthcare inequalities, by having the data we can actually start seeing them where they appear, by trying to deal with data-driven methods that can help us treat patients uh, better, or more precisely and faster, we can overcome challenges that we have, for example, there's not enough staff that can uh, be decently paid and sufficiently uh, hired to, to, to provide these services. So we are in a unique setting, uh, and we are here also in a unique setting because it's not just the researchers, the, uh, the clinical people, but also because we have a regulatory framework that fairly uniquely allows us to access patient records for the benefit of health without the patient's consent. And that's a very sensitive topic to many, but it puts us in a unique situation globally. That we could do that, it helped us during the pandemic, and it was helped us in the coming years to have a unique ecosystem at our disposal. I want to dig in slightly to the, what you raised about the issue of inequalities. And you know, the one thing I do know about data and computing is like, if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. If you don't have diverse data in, you can't actually have solutions that work for many people. What are some of the issues there in trying to address the, the diversity of the, the data and then how this data could you know, potentially reinforce inequalities if we don't use it well? Yes, so I think this is one of the interesting things. AIs do what, learn, from the information that you give them. So if the data is biased, you amplify the biases. Interestingly enough, it's the data people who are aware that this happens. And so they start looking and querying more and more, how does our data actually look like? And then you find these interesting relationships that if you're a female uh, and operated on by a male surgeon, you have a much higher chance of dying during surgery. Um, it's still a very low risk, but you know it's, it's twice as much as if you have a female surgeon. So these are all these things, these little bits and pieces that you discover if you start looking at data seriously. And the key thing is for that, you need to be able to see the data. Um, and that is only really done properly if there's a means of harnessing the data. So these things come together and this awareness grows and builds up on each other. Many, I'd like to bring you in here. So obviously, you know, AstraZeneca, you're making a range of medicines. Um, how are you trying to use data to make medicines more effective for, for more people? How, how, how is this kind of working, the intersection of data and health? I mean, look, we use, we use data from all over the world, and I think you're absolutely right. The, the NHS and, and the population data we can get from the UK is unique, although we don't use it, I think, particularly well um, at, at the moment, or, or to its full potential. We use it in pocket. The, the pandemic the pandemic's actually driven, I think, lots of really good examples of what you can do. People measuring vaccine effectiveness um, we're using you know, real-world data from NHS England, NHS Scotland, although there were fights between who was going to present it first. And so there was a little bit of politics a, a, around how some of that data was shared and, and presented and who was doing what. But the reality is that that was one of the data sets that people were using to understand vaccine effectiveness beyond the clinical trials that were run. So being able to use, uh, and again, the, the, just the systems we have, I can give an example of a, dive, of a study that we've, we've been running um, with one of our medicines, which is a randomized registry, which is one of the first of its kind, which is you know, a placebo-controlled randomized registry using electronic health records from NHS and actually from Sweden. 
um, and measuring outcomes on myocardial infarction, strokes, um, sorry, heart attacks, I mean. So it's, it's potentially very, very powerful, but quite difficult to do. And actually, the more countries can generate this population data or the more regions, whether it's a health system in the US or other countries, the, the more powerful the data becomes. The NHS is something that's quite unique, but I don't think right now it's set up in a way where physicians are rewarded for doing clinical research, for doing data science research. There's, you know, huge pressures on their time. And I think we need an environment where actually we're encouraging this type of research and we're creating the space for it to happen. Um, because without it, I think it becomes very, very difficult to, to actually progress the quality of care that we want for our population. So, Rena, we've, we've talked a bit about, you know, data and, and data on populations, and you're looking at, you know, one of the most fundamental differences is the difference between male and female. So, how, how does this difference intersect with our health? Yeah, it's actually quite surprising, right, because we, we like to talk about precision medicine and we forget about the major, you know, one major difference that divides half of the population, which is sex, right, sex and gender. Um, unfortunately, most research is still done in males or is still done without taking into consideration the sex of your animals or the sex of your humans when you, when you analyze clinical data. This is changing, it's beginning to change. Um, but it's still the fact that many of the conclusions, scientific conclusions that we're now using, you know, that we're now using to develop drugs were made based on, on sort of the study of a single sex. And that's led to some problems, um, also even the developing of drugs, right? I think there are examples from antidiuretics that were developed based on um, sort of male data, and they were applied to females, and actually that, that caused problems, right? So, and I think um, cardiovascular disease, um, at the level of diagnosis, at the level of um, of a burden as well. I mean, most, most disorders are sex bias in, in their incidence of progression, but the symptoms may differ. So, the symptoms of, of sort of stroke, the symptoms of heart attack can be different between males and females. And, and we're used to the male ones just because we've done research in, in males. So I think that is an important sort of um, unmet need. And I think that's something that's slowly changing, but I think we need to continue to um, sort of champion it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pretty fundamental inequality. If yeah, exactly. Males and females aren't getting the, exactly. the, the right treatments they need. Um, moving on to like where we see the, the really exciting just sorry, just I want to just oh, correct yeah. one thing. So obviously, doing preclinical research in females versus males, I completely agree with. In the same way that we do research in young animals versus old animals, mm -hmm. and they're all, you know, bred from single lines, so that they're not very heterogeneous. Clinical trial generally are done across populations, across ages, across risk groups. So I don't, I don't for think... For COVID, there's actually a good example. Not all of them. But I'm saying, generally, so. actually, <laughs> if you want to get approved in, by major yeah, regulators, you, you need to have yeah. unbiased populations. And that's one of the things that people check when you do your yeah. big pivotal studies. Was there something interesting about the COVID, COVID studies? No, I think there's bad stuff throughout the world for some of the COVID um, studies. I think preclinical, but also some of the clinical ones. Not all of them were done in... in but the vaccine studies The vaccine across, studies, yeah, yeah. That's sure, my point. Absolutely. When you get into the clinic, you have to do things across yeah, yeah. males, females, high risk, low risk, all age groups, or else you won't get approved. Yeah, yeah I, I wrote a book about cancer a little while back, and it was like, you know, we do all these experiments on young male mice and it's like it's, it's older people who get cancer mostly so um yeah i think uh, we could we could spend all, all night talking about sort of better models and diversity but i want to move out to um where we think sort of the new frontiers are and um i think i'll, I'll start with aldo sort of working in there <laughs> sure and there's, there's probably things that we can we can all bring in because I'm, I'm really interested to see where you think um some of the frontiers are i mean we all get very excited about ai and you know, we're all walking around with little devices on us that are measuring data about our, our health and our bodies. So where is where is the stuff going? So I think, first of all, one of the most interesting or surprises that we had over the past few years is the realization that data saves lives and that if you work with algorithms, the pathway from algorithm to the bedside is much, much shorter than from the bench, the lab bench to the to the bedside. So you can develop technologies on healthcare data, and within two years, you can deploy them in the NHS. And that's, that's very transformative, because it effectively means that a PhD student can have fundamental research ideas and see it delivered in their lifetime. So, you know, we have a center of material in AI for healthcare, where we're doing this with over 60, 70 projects so far, et 
exactly along that line. That's very empowering for the people who want to do that, but it also means that you can provide patients, taxpayers with the motivation that you can really get to these results quickly. So that's, I think, the preface for what's possible. And I think the exciting thing about AI is a lot of people think still about AI as being able to deal with data. But the real thing that that's exciting about AI is agency. Its systems can produce something on their own. And so this means that in the classic world, you, you take a chemical, you flood your whole body with a chemical, and some little part of your body gets then treated by the, by the chemical. With AI, you can think about little devices that do something very specific in a very specific location in the moment that you need it for the time that you need it. And I think this, this ability to interact and be an agent, just like ourselves are agents of, them, of their own, that's one of the most exciting things about AI that I see for treating our health and maintaining it. It's that sort of getting into the fantastic voyage kind of territory. <laughs> <laughs> it is, Gomez, so it is incredibly powerful. And just again, for, for, for the audience and for those of you that don't know about research and development, I mean, success rates in our industry. So if you take a, and I'm going to just talk about not in the research that, but from the time you identify a molecule that you want to start clinical trials with to the time that you have a successful medicine, right, that period of time which takes anywhere between five and ten years, generally more in the ten-year range unless you're working in very rapidly progressing cancers, the success rate of our industry is around 6%. Right? So for every 100 molecules we put into the clinic, six medicines come out. So you can imagine when you're investing $8 billion a year, what type of investment and risk you're having to take to get a single medicine out. And those companies that are doing well have higher success rates, 15, 16, 20%. They only fail you know, 80% of the time. The not so well performing companies are failing more than 90% of the time. So AI is incredibly important because it helps us get better at what we do. The reason preclinical research is so important is because you work on a target in biology in, when you work in a fight, potentially for 15 years, 20 years. And if you're working on the wrong target, the wrong pathway, the wrong biology, it doesn't matter how good your molecule is or how good your antibody is, you don't get a medicine at the end of it because your hypothesis is wrong. And so what I, AI is helping us do is it's helping us improve across every facet of what we do in research and development. So give you a couple of examples. In chemistry, we optimize, if we're working on small molecules, the traditional pills that we take orally, things like paracetamol, when we optimize a molecule that hits a receptor, we normally make five to 10,000 co compounds over three, four, five years. If we could only make 200 compounds in one year, that dramatically improves our efficiency. And AI now is able to help us optimize how we design and think about our molecules because we can take all of the data we've generated and everyone else is generating in patents and in chemistry publications and use that to help our chemists think about how to optimize those molecules more efficiently. You can do the same, you know, for those of you that are PhD students or postdocs, you work in a relatively focused area. How many papers can you read a day? Five, ten? You know, I'm Shall being optimistic. Us? One, no, no, I'm saying, right? I'm being, I'm, you know, for the, you know but, but it's, it's limited to how much. You, and then think about how many papers are being published in your area a day or a week or a month all over the world. You might read the Nature paper or the Neuron paper. But now with, with, with databases and with AI, we can start to access everything that is published every single day and start to draw links between. You might be interested in something in oncology with KRAS and something may be coming out in KRAS in gastrointestinal disease or dermatology. And you'll never make those links because you're not thinking about it. And it may have some insights that actually help you in your oncology work. Now, using these databases and AI, we can bring all of these data sets together and start to uncover completely new pathways the new areas of research so that when we're now working in some of our areas in diversity, that there's literally one paper on the thing that we're working on, but it's being pulled from a plethora of data all around the world that has tried to con combine all of these things to give us new insights into disease. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say that, in fact, a major challenge for the future for scientists and, and humans in general is to, to sort of to figure out what it is that kind of is evolved to automation and to machine learning, right? 
I think in some ways what makes us uniquely human and what will not be able to be, you know, devolved and sort of um, replaced by machines. And I think that's something that as scientists we need to consider and, and constantly refresh uh, in our science. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting following my own journey as, uh, as a scientist. It's like when I was a PhD student, we had to do mini preps. And it's like, there's a machine that does that now. Yeah. And I think as well, it's like, what, what is the value of human endeavor when AI and, and technology can, can help us do things? Like, what, what value do we add? I think one of the most exciting things that can I help us in doing science better is take the human element of bias out. Yeah. So if you think about how we typically do science, we do very reductionistic, simple experiments uh, to work something out where we can basically have the most basic logic um, so that we can analyze the data easily because it's very hard for us to analyze data. But this means we're putting a lot of bias in how we design the experiment, how we carry things out, while actually an AI does not care about that. An AI can find structure and data that's very, very complex. And this means we can even think about abandoning the classic bench as the sole form of research and complement it with research and data that happens in the real world. Right, um, where we can look beyond the few compounds that you test or the few factors that you test and look what the impact of the weather, the news, the pollution, and all other factors that impact our health that we know about. That news makes us feel bad. Being lonely makes us feel bad. But we cannot disentangle them from, say, the functioning of your pancreas in some way. And with, with the ability of AI to handle and process this data, we can think about how to unlock this sort of data and look at health much more holistically than from every single discipline. And this is perfect for what I want to ask Irena about, which is, you know, we, we focus for a long time in, in terms of health about like our bodies, our cells, but there are billions and billions of bacteria, viruses, fungi living in us, on us, up us, up our noses. Um, and this <coughs> adds a whole, it feels like it's sort of adding a whole wild card to biology. So what, how has this field sort of emerged and, and where are the, the frontiers here? Yeah, I guess there's one kilo of bacteria one you know, mm -hmm. inside us, right? Inside our gut. And we have as many, I think the latest estimates, we have as many bacterial cells as our own cells um, within our gut. Um, and that's something that, that that we kind of disregarded for many years. And I think it's quite clear now that these bacteria control many aspects of our, not just physiology, but even behavior, right? I think there are links between the microbes that live within um, within our guts and, and, and how we feel and how we function. Um, but actually going back to the discussion about machine learning, I think that's a good example of, of finding what you were not looking for. And, and in my opinion, that's still a uniquely human, uh, or, you know, a uniquely human feature, right? I think most of our experiments, we set them up in a very reductionist way, as Aldo is saying. Um, but often what happens, you know, to my students and my postdocs and myself is you're looking for something and you serendipitously find something else. And that turns out to be the much more interesting thing that we didn't necessarily anticipate. And, and, and you know, if you gear up a sort of experiment to sort of try and find features for a particular, you know, disease, for a particular outcome of your experiment, you might, you might miss that and the machine may miss that. And I think that's something that still makes, I like to think still makes us valuable. And, and that's, you know, the, the way in which we, for example, now consider we did that, there's actually thousands of labs now exploring, um, so the microbes within, and, and and there's even sort of companies trying to to target the brain from the gut. So it's obviously it's a much more accessible uh, place than than the brain itself. So I think um, yeah yeah it's incredible. You've basically got um, like a, the the is it vagal nerve that goes from like your gut to your brain, to and this sort of idea that your gut bacteria is somehow like fiddling with the end of this nerve or the, the molecules they produce and. It's, um, I, and in fact, a lot more neuronal information goes from the gut to the brain and from the brain to the gut. Mm -hmm. So we think that the brain's controlling the gut, but it's the other way around, probably. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> think about that when you're eating your canapes. Yeah. yeah. Gut feelings, yeah. Gut feelings, absolutely true. Um, so we, we've talked a lot about uh, all these exciting things, sort of data, the research, but um, how do we make sure that the discoveries that are being made in, in buildings like this, in the labs, do actually get push through and become things that make our lives better, you know, new treatments, new technologies, things that help the NHS. Um, if you yeah, hand up if you'd like to start with that one. Oh, let's, let's. I, think, I think the translator, it's interesting because I mean, I think buildings like the Crick and the LMB, I think have done a pretty good job um, of actually creating things that become comfy. I think the bigger challenge actually isn't spinning things out in those seed 
companies. I think we've actually got a reasonable venture capital community and um, angel investor community here that we can actually get a lot of those things funded. The biggest challenge is actually helping those companies thrive and go from being, you know, five, ten people to being 150 to 150, 500 people and then staying here in the UK. And, and that really does get to the investment environment in the UK. You know, what's the tax environment? What's the um, health innovation environment? You know, how, how quickly are medicines are done? It's, it's all of the things that go hand in hand with successful biotech and pharmaceutical companies. Um, I think the clo ha having a successful biotech and pharma industry helps because, you know, we sit next door to the LMB, you, you walk in, each, in and out of each other's labs, you, you start to talk to each other, you help them, they help you, you try and create these symbiotic relationships. So, you know, what I would encourage any academic institution to do is to try and create as many symbiotic relationships with the private sector that, whose job it is to sort of help translate that basic research into applied research and ultimately hopefully medicines and medical care um, and, and you know hopefully give people tips so what we've done is you know one of that's one of the reasons why we moved down to Cambridge for Audley Park but in, in Sweden in, in, uh, in our site in Gothenburg you know we've created bioparks on our site where people can come and use our equipment and use our machines and we can help those startups with a helping hand so they have to big, do big capital outlays they can speak to our regulatory folks who want some advice. So I think creating an environment where we you create symbiotic relationships where both parties benefit, I think, is, is, is very, very helpful. But ultimately, you need a country that wants to invest in life science, R&D, in the health sector. That, that I think, is the, is the, will be the biggest driver of uh, future prosperity in that area. I bet you've got a nice cafe as well. We do have a nice cafe. Food, <laughs> good, good, good food and coffee helps, yeah. Um, Irena, from your perspective here at the LMS, and, you know, thinking about you and all your colleagues, like how, how are you working to, to make connections and kind of take the science out, out of the doors? Yeah, I mean, I think I would agree. I think we need investment. I think that's the main, that, that's the main thing. We need proximity. We need, we need interaction with, with, um, with pharma. We need interaction between clinicians and, and, and discovery scientists. And I think that's something so that, that I think the, discover, the interactions between discovery scientists and clinicians, that's something that that is happening and that we, we, we foster and that we, we plan to foster further. I think um, we, we do need a, an open mind, I think, to sort of translate that, that sort of fundamental discoveries into um, into something more applied. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm just hopeful that this new building and, uh, and the proximity um, that we now have, not just between us, but also with um, clinicians and with, um, and, with, and with pharma will sort of uh, foster further. Translation from this perspective. I think it's interesting what you said about sometimes the discoveries that you make are not where you were expecting to look. And I, I think sometimes there can be a big drive. It's like you must do translational research. Everything's got to have a point and a purpose and a end goal and a you know a product or a drug in mind. But I, I guess you, you must still see this really fundamental role for more discovery research. For more discovery and also for, for perhaps non-canonical translation of mm. pipelines. And, and what I mean by that is that I guess we have this mindset that. <laughs> We make a discovery in an animal model and then we take it to say we make a discovery in flies and then we take it to mice and then we take it to humans right and there's no point studying anything in flies if, if, if it's a gene that's not found in humans right um but if you think for example about i don't know vector borne disease right so mosquitoes and you know and all the sort of parasites and if we understand their biology actually we have a better chance to find drugs that are specific for for these animals and the diseases that they transmit, right? So, so we may start the research in mosquitoes or in types of flies or in certain parasites, and then eventually we can take it to humans. Um, and that's a slightly less sort of a, um, sort of from from sort of worm to, to human or from fly to human sort of pipeline, right? And and I think there can be a lot of iteration in these pipelines. I think we can we can make an observation in humans, and we may be limited in what we can do to a human, but then we can go back to a fly to a worm, test, test what it's doing there and then back or do a genetic screen in high throughput ways in, in yeast and in flies and in cells and then take it back to humans. So, so I think we need to keep a, an open mind about how, how we translate and what kind of a, um, translation of pipelines we, we use. And, and that's what I, what I meant in, in some ways by keeping an open mind and have a sort of an outside the box mindset. And, and that's something that I think we should, we should foster as scientists and as clinicians and as, as pharma, I think. There's still always a role for in vivo as well as in vitro and yeah, now absolutely. in silicon. Yeah. Yeah. 
And speaking of in Sinico, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, I'm doing my best. <laughs> I'm glad that I'm, I'm the digital person here. Yeah, um, so the so I, actually, I think one of the most exciting drivers of health is not what pill you take, but what choices you make in your life about food, about exercise, about thinking good thoughts, not, you know, not going down bad pathways of thinking. And so a lot of what technology can do is to help us with our choices and our behavior, inform us, make us more responsible for our health, but also giving us the tools to support us in our journey towards lifelong health. I think the goal is not that I turn 200 and, you know, the last 120 years I spent in the hospital bed, but that I turn 100 maybe, but have a long and rich life uh, where my health span, not my lifespan, is maximized. And this is something where technologies can help us understand ourselves and help ourselves overcome these behavioral triggers that may make us make unwise choices. <laughs> um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. If anyone has any questions, please pop your hand up. We don't have a raving mic, so if you can shout your question nice and loud. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you, those practical points, make the recountable time? So say to give an example, um, in this big paper last year, uh, it was describing how, um, particularly in Africa, how nurse primary consumption, and that data was submitted publicly, and that's not the data that went into Um, but the level of sequencing that we were talking about was far higher than any of the vaccines that we actually saw administered in the future. So it's quite a fair example where we can look at the data set and then we can actually catch up in the value of the last year. Okay, just to, to reiterate for the recording, so how do, we, uh, how do we return value to the people who do give their data for research? Many, many do you want to? Take, take that one to start with? Well, it's like we gave our vaccine at the cost. So 70% of our vaccine went to the developing world and low and middle income countries, and we did it at cost. So, no, how much it cost to make the vaccine? So, we did it at not for profit. Yeah, that's how that basic The manufacturing, we had manuf about 20 manufacturing sites around the world because, yeah, yeah, yeah. The cost of how much it is produced in a. No, it'd be the cost, it was a cost from the vaccine in India, actually made by the Serum Institute of India that supplies most third world countries or developing world countries. So it was done at not for profit at a reason, you know, a few dollars a dose. No, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm saying, I'm so saying we, it's an, exa it's an yeah. example of, of something that I think that was, at least from our perspective, we were very proud of and we did it working with Oxford University to make sure that actually the vaccine was available all around the world. We can talk about how data sets were used and whether data was in interpreted correctly and why more vaccines weren't used in Africa. Um, but I think ultimately when you do research and develop, as I said, success rates are very low, right? So if you're spending eight or whatever, how many billion dollars a year, you have to generate a return on your investment. If you don't generate a return on your investment, you have no money to then do more and more R&D the next year. And generally, pharmaceutical companies are public trade companies. They also have to generate a return for their investors. So it has to be a for-profit business. In terms of, again, just to talk about pricing, just because you're basically asking about equality of medicines and pricing and that, most, most companies do, tier, because even if Africa hadn't contributed to sequencing of COVID variants, as did many other countries, South American countries, Southeast Asian countries, the US, Europe, et cetera, we were sequencing variants all over the world. Um, but their health equality is important and everyone does need to have access to medicines. And generally what companies do is they do tiered pricing. You have higher cost pricing for high income countries. You have middle tier pricing for middle income countries and you have low tier pricing for low income countries. Sometimes still not affordable, but there is 
that there is some level of trying to make medicines as accessible as possible to all countries around the world. I think there's a there's also an interesting yeah. question I'd like to bring I'll, I'll go on about um, thinking about things like we have in the UK the NHS health data and people contribute this and people might <coughs> you know sequence as part of various projects and it's like well how much does this data you know b belong to us and then if people are contributing their data and uh, you know how, how does that work in terms of if this does lead to, to products and services and, and this kind of thing. I think you know there are big projects like UK Biobank where we have half a million people sequenced and and, and studied and, and, and harnessed all data. That's the sort of people actively contributing. It's a very specific wide middle aged female demographic that likes to contribute to these questions. If you're now looking at the NHS data, I think it's one of the big challenges of NHS, but also one of the opportunities of NHS to use that not just to benefit the patients, but to also maybe overcome some cost challenges. There's the risk of starting buzzword bingo. Uh, there is technologies and there are projects that we're also involved in where we're talking about using so-called blockchain technology, where people can give their data in, they control their data, they can take it back, that if this data is used to monetize something, they could get something in return. This can be at the level of the citizen, of the state, NHS, or to the individual NHS trust. And these various solutions are being actively explored how to make it more participatory for you to donate your data and get something back. Yeah. Um, do we have uh, another question before we wrap up? Um, we'll take one right, right at the back there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the question is, what, what did we learn through the pandemic? Because obviously the vaccines, whether they're mRNA vaccines or the Chadox vaccine were developed very quickly, and actually the antibodies and the antivirals were developed pretty quickly as well. It was a combination of many different things that helped. Um, governments paying at risk to procure vaccines. Um, companies, um, com governments paying the, co the companies at risk to do the development and saying, you know, if it's successful, we're going to buy this many doses from you. So you had contracts in place um, before you knew whether the thing was going to work or not that was going to cover the costs of you doing the research and development. The, the regulators were working in a very different way with us in terms of the, it was a day to day interaction where you were actually looking at data in real time having conversations and, and, and creating an environment where you could interact with them on a much more proactive and reactive way versus the way that we generally work with them, which is you do a submission, you wait three months for the first um, response and you wait another six months for the next thing and over 12 months you get your approval or not. So it was a very, very different way of market working, which is basically working hand in hand with public systems, healthcare systems, governments and regulates in the way that everyone was doing things at risk. So you know, we were investing in manufacturing sites all around the world without knowing whether anything was going to work or not, as were Pfizer, as were Moderna and other companies. So it really required a lot of parallel processing that you wouldn't normally do because the success rates are so low. What I would say we've learned is, you know, we've created an environment where we know that we can work differently with regulators. Um, we're not working differently with them on all things, but I think it's creating an environment where we do know what it feels like to work differently with them. And so we can push each other in a little bit of a different way than we used to. I think we've created an environment where we've seen the benefits. Now I'm talking from a pharmaceutical perspective of where you want to take more risk rather than less risk in terms of things that you might do in parallel, whether it's toxicology studies or making drug product or substance at risk taking two molecules in parallel, doing some of your activities, you know, rather than sequentially altogether, assuming success, um, which we, we, I would say we're doing now maybe you know, out of our you know, 150, 200 projects, maybe do for one or two projects that are really, really important or really competitive, or we feel very confident that if we can, you know, get 
do the right things that it will become a medicine that's going to have a you know a, 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 a big impact so i think those are the types of things that we've learned i have seen i have to say unfortunately over the past 12 months a very rapid retrenchment into normality which is quite disappointing because i think we've missed a little bit of an opportunity whether it's how governments respond um how um, regulators are working or or even how pharma is working so I think there are things that we have learned, but we have also retrenched quite quickly. Yeah, Alvin, oh, last word, please. Oh, God. So <laughs> I, 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 just, I just wanted to add, add a point that I think there's again, a change in the population about how technologies can help us with health. Mm -hmm. We all used to stay up, we all did in vitro testing at home, and, and this made us more a bit citizen scientists in some way. And this openness can transform things. So, with colleagues here at LMS, we, we, we develop methods, for example, that allows to rapidly accelerate clinical trials, you know, reducing the duration by half, we use yeah, just a tenth absolutely. of the patient. So these are technologies. And the recovery study, I mean, some of the studies that were set up super, super fast. In, in, yeah, by yeah. this acceptance, yeah. by the change of our citizens, yeah. not of our scientists, we can do things at an unprecedented scale. That I think that change is going to be lasting. The cultural no, no, I agree. <laughs> the, the, biggest, the biggest shift, I mean, you know, if you say what, what, what's the most important thing that's happened beyond the fact that we've now got some therapies and we can get hopefully back to a semblance of normality, is the population understands the impact of what we do, right? The impact of life sciences and, and what actually doing research development and ultimately, you know, data science, health science, research and development, biotech. They've seen the impact it can have on our communities. I mean, it's that, that, that in itself is massive, right? Because I think it's educated people in terms of why what we do is important. I can't think of a better place to end. So a <laughs> huge round of applause for So I'll sort of there. Um, it's absolutely fascinating. So um, we now have a poetry break. Um, so, um, so these are some poems that are in the book, The Picture of Health, and we're going to hear them uh, obviously read by the poets. So our first poet is Hugo Williams, and his poem, Billy's Rain, won the T.S. Eliot Prize in 1999. His collected poems published in 2002, and his last collection, I Need a Bride, was published in 2014 and was shortlisted for the Forward and the T.S. Eliot Prizes. And in 2004, he received the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry. And he'll be reading his poem now that is uh, in the book. Uh, this is about the deal you have to make with dialysis, which is five hours every other day for the rest of your life. Very jolly. But there's a little psychologist upstairs waiting in case you have a nervous breakdown, so that's always something. It's called The Deal. If you feel like a change, you can swap your present condition for a case of dizziness, bed for breathlessness, cramps for unconsciousness. You can lower your blood pressure in return for a sick headache, bore yourself to death watching the wheels going round, or die of blood poisoning. When you've cut some sort of deal with the laws of nature and passed another day on your back, you can totter out of there in thrall to the velvet hour. Sensing around you the promise of night-scented streets and the recklessness of summer, you wonder what you would give in exchange for this. Our second poem is from Brian Patton, and uh, he rose to fame with his uh, Mersey Sound collection in 1967, which is now a Penguin modern classic. He's a master performer of his work. He's read in venues as varied as the Queen Elizabeth Hall and the Students' Union in Khartoum. And his most recent book is The Book of Upside Down Thinking, a comic verse inspired by traditional stories from the Near and Middle East. So I'm very excited to watch the video of him performing his poem. I wrote this poem after being invited onto an immunotherapy trial to find the best way to test out some new drugs people with renal cell cancer and other cancers at the Rome Arson, and it's called A Peach Belinda. Dear heart, I've been given a new cannula into which our futures pump 
Warm evenings drip into the blood, the scent of fig trees too. And in between each drop winds a dusty path that leads to a tavern on a beach. And all we ever wanted is still within our reach, and we can order wine and share a peach. So we're now going to uh, move into a bit more of an active section of the evening where you're going to get to go and explore the exhibition. Um, we also have a bit of a craft table. I don't know if anyone's feeling crafty, where you'll be able to explore making a kite. Now, um, the exact reason why people are making kites for the LMS, I don't know, is this about like lofty expectations, flying high, um, or just kites are quite cool? Um, so, uh, we have uh, the PhD students at the LMS have been making kites. You will be able to get the opportunity to make a kite should you wish. And I think we also do have a little video explaining the, uh, the kite today. When I was a kid, I was interested in kite flying. So I stopped doing it for a long period of time. And during COVID, I decided to make kites again. I've been working for the LMS for nearly 14, getting on to 15 years now. And today we're here to do a kite workshop, making kites with about 10 to 15 students. People know that there's a sort of imperial campus at Hammersmith, but I don't think they necessarily particularly know that much about the LMS. And I think part of that has been because we've been in sort of a random building. The new building is basically a state of the art facility. It was made purposefully for translational and experimental medicine. I love the big windows and I think it'll be quite a fun space for us to have. And I think this gives us an opportunity to interact more between the labs and at the same time improve the way we socially interact. I think we just reverse engineering the kite. Normally scientists love to have a proper protocol where we follow step by step. I mean, for me, I think it's great to have a balance of both discovery-based research and also how you translate that into impacts later on. I think there's a lot of bridge between art and science. Like, I think the science need to be a little bit artistic in order to uh, survive in this environment because we need to have new ideas, we need to create new experiments. And for me, it's kind of like an art. I think it's great that we can combine both of them. The more we try to help each other, the more we socialize uh, among each other. This creates kind of a family that allows us not only to feel this like this is our home, but also improve our science. And I think we've done a pretty good job in that regard. I would like to encourage everyone to come and fly a kite for the LMS. Many thanks. Now come go fly a kite. <laughs> Absolutely fabulous. Um, and thanks to uh, Kiki, Kiki von Glasso for um, directing and creating that film. So now is the opportunity for you to get off your bums and uh, go and explore the exhibition. Please have a drink, please chat to each other, have some lovely nibbles. We will be back here, please, by about 20 past eight. And then we'll have another discussion um, and the uh, evening will end at 9.15. As, uh... Okay, hello everybody. Hi. 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 Okay. Let's try that again. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. 
Uh, welcome back. I think, oh, come on, this is the post wine bit, isn't it? You're, you're going to be rowdy, aren't you? Trouble. Um, thank you very much for coming back. Uh, I do appreciate the reason you've all come back is because there are no pubs around here. So you're stuck. That's the problem. Um, before we go any further, I think I hope you've all had a chance to look at the fabulous exhibition. You've looked at the, the poems, the pictures, the films. You've picked up your copy of the book. Um, we need to say a really big thank you to the person who actually made all of this happen. And that is Professor Dame Amanda Fisher at the back, give her a huge round of applause. Uh, Mandy has been an absolutely incredible champion of communicating science to the public, bringing art and science together, setting up collaborations, uh, doing work with Central St. Martins, all kinds of, um, so at some point maybe seeing like crazy madcap schemes, um, the suffrage science scheme, creating jewellery to celebrate women in science, art projects, making textiles, uh, all kinds of writing projects, picture books, children's books, just incredible communications projects. And you are, you are a real inspiration, Mandy. So thank you very much for all that you've done in that area. Real inspiration to me, definitely, as, as well. Um, the first thing we're going to start this half with is with a fabulous poem. And uh, this is a poem in person. We're very honoured to be joined by Elisha Gabb, who is a performance poet. She's a recent graduate of the Creative Writing MA at Brunel University. She's, uh, she performs her poems all over the place, and she's currently working on her first poetry collection. And she's going to read uh, her contribution to the picture of health, which is a poem called Nirvana. Elisha, the floor is yours. I see her holding her space so beautifully amongst the naked wilderness that sculpts itself around her oval belly. White mist rises as she exhales towards the morning sky. She welcomes us. With a bit of cloth covering my core, I stare at her. Excitement and fear overlap one another, racing for first place. But before either of them get a chance to win, gently she pulls me in. I join her in exhaling loudly so she can hear me. Her honesty burns my skin, but I know I need to feel it. A quarter of the way around, she softens on my body. She begins to wash my mind. Swallowing yesterday's terrors, she tells me all I need to know, and I think of nothing. The trees swoop lower to greet her, and then to greet me. I smile. I look around at the other bodies, and we're all okay. I wonder if she knows she heals us that her coldness fills our hearts with so much warmth. Arise and seize, she stays. She's a woman and her name is Water. Thank you. Absolutely fabulous. Um, we also now have another video for you. This is a video from the Free Wheelers Group. This is an inclusive theatre group that's based in Surrey, and they've made this video specially for us. This is showcasing a rehearsal from a musical they've been working on about Dagar. Um, this has been performed across the UK, and we also have a representative from the group here tonight. This is Felicity. So if you have any questions about the group, please do go and ask her. So we're now going to watch the Free Wheelers video. Company. 
It breaks your little head. And sorry. All sessions lead to performances, filmings, or exhibitions. And members are all involved in every stage of development, from the early ideas right down to the performance. members of work in dance, theatre, film, music, visual art and animation. We perform at venues throughout the South East and London with many productions touring. We aim to develop as artists, entertain, innovate, collaborate and challenge perceptions. We also take workshops into schools. The full workshop led by the members. I just love dancing. I, I know I can't stop saying that. I, I just, in here, I, I know I can sometimes love dance as well. I do. I love that. That's joyous. That's <laughs> fantastic. Uh, can't get back into my phone. No idea what's happening next. Uh, we now have another panel discussion. So we've heard about the future of health. This panel discussion is now thinking more about what makes a healthy world and what is health to us. And that's really what the Picture of Health project was all about, is getting people to express in whatever art form they wanted what, what health meant to them and it's been an incredibly diverse range of things you've had from scientific images through to sort of very abstract artworks. And for the panel we are going to introduce, we have Francesca Happe. Um, she is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at King's College London. For the last 30 years her research has focused on autism and most recently focusing on mental health on the autism spectrum and under research subgroups including women and the elderly. We're joined by Professor Kevin Fenton. He is a senior public health expert and infectious disease epidemiologist. He's worked in a variety of public health executive leadership roles across government, academia, all the big stuff internationally. And uh, obviously, as you might expect, was a leading light in London's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're also joined by Harry Leach. He's a last minute replacement to the panel, so well done, Harry, for stepping in. He heads up the germline and pluripotency group here at the LMS. He and his team are studying the very earliest processes of life to see how they can shed light on uh, human disease later in life. He's also a clinical lecturer in genetics. He has a special interest in developmental disorders when these processes of early development go wrong. And uh, also, I understand he returned to the front line as a clinician during COVID as well. Yes. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, a big round for our panel. Thank you. Um, so we have the contributions uh, from the book from Francesca and from Kevin. So I'm actually going to ask you to talk a little bit about your contributions. Who have we got up first? Uh, okay, there we go. <laughs> um, Kevin, we're going to put up your, your picture from the book. Uh, do tell us about this one. So first of all, I was really, uh, touched and honored to be invited to contribute uh, a photograph uh, for this work. Uh, in part because when we, I received the invitation, we were still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the pressure and the intensity of that experience was relentless. So to have an opportunity to step away from the pandemic response and to think about something creative, think about something that brought me joy, was an important moment at that time. So let me begin by just saying thank you for the, the invitation. This picture I'm sharing with you was taken in Mykonos, uh, a beautiful August summer evening uh, in Mykonos. 
What's important in it for me is that it takes me back to my childhood memories. I was raised in Jamaica, and many of my early memories are by the seaside, playing with my brothers and sisters, my parents, enjoying the sound and setting, feeling the warmth of the Caribbean Sea, the spray of the sea on my skin, the noise and the laughter and the joy that being close to water has brought to me. And throughout the course of my life, as I've gotten older, going close to water has always been a place of restoration, of relaxation, of reinvigoration for me. So I wanted to share this photo because when I was asked about uh, well-being and health and what it means to me, I think this summarized it for me, that health is just more than your physical well-being. It's about your mental well-being. It's about how you're connected to others. It's about the memories and the connections that we have. And it's the way in which we connect with each other and empower each other. And I think the sunset really brought that to me. And I wanted to share that with you. So Thank you. that's it. And Jessica, what was, what was yours? We're going to stay now. So likewise, I was incredibly um, honoured to be invited to contribute. And I immediately thought that what I wanted to do was collaborate with, in this case, a neurodivergent artist who's also a researcher with whom we're looking at autism and autistic burnout, experience of burnout. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, working uh, in co-production is really a very relatively new movement in research in neurodiversity. Um, and in the 30 years I've been working in autism, it's one of the many things that's changed a lot. So I wanted to reflect that in this. And so what you see is, is a life journey and, and the pictures should really be you know, horizontally laid out. So you see the journey from the toddler to the young child, to the adolescent, to the adult. And it captures what a lot of autistic people tell us about their experiences, experience as a young child of a world that might be sensorily overloading with a lot of confusion, confusion from parents too, when it often is a late diagnosis, um, and, but also delight, delight in a, in a vivid sensory world. And you can see that at each life stage, you have artwork of that sort of age group expressing what that person is feeling. And then as the young child, the, the growing sense that you're different, that you don't fit in, that maybe people perceive you as a burden or people think you're difficult or stubborn when in fact you're just very, very different in how you process the world. The feeling that you are somehow a problem in being different. Um, and assuming again still that we're still waiting for that diagnosis and some of our work is about under diagnosis of autism in women and girls. We then move on to adolescence and the single word lost. Um, and this is capturing in particular the very high rates of mental ill health in autism. So around 70% of children and adults on the autism spectrum also meet criteria for a, a mental health condition, anxiety, depression, and sadly suicide is, is also um, greatly elevated. But then we finish with a much more optimistic picture. So maybe now an adult who's achieved a diagnosis who begins to know something about the fact that they're not broken or wrong, they are different. Um, and there are other people who are different like them um, and that they're part of diversity, neurodiversity in parallel with ecological diversity. So we still have the words in pain, which appear in the first picture, but we also have autistic and we also have at peace and we have learning and a sense of, of movement forward. So that's what we're trying to capture here. And there's are interesting things to be said about um, how the medical model of things like autism has viewed them as disease, as illness. And we really wanted, in contrast, to talk about a picture of health, an autistic person who's a healthy person, often struggling in a world that isn't really designed for them. Thank you very much for sharing that. And Harry, you, you uh, as, as a stand-in, um, didn't get to, to contribute to this project, but I'd be interested to know sort of what you think for you, and, and certainly with some of the families that you work with in terms of um, genetic disorders, you know, how have you come to understand the concept of health and, and what health means through, through your work? Yeah, I mean, I think particularly in, in my clinical work in genetics now, where, you know, with the advances and actually one of the very well funded areas in the NHS is genomics and basically any child born now who's severely unwell with a likely genetic disorder we can 
do whole genome sequencing of them and their parents. You've got diagnosis rates of above 60%. And you've got this tiny newborn creature in front of you, and you're doing a test that can really tell us so much about their future. And a lot of that news is pretty tough news. And it can impact, you know, this little, what we predict for this baby in so many ways. It could be very severe health problems, uh, problems with learning disability we can predict in the future, physical problems. And I think, but also the uncertainty in that the, the genetics is, is a piece of the puzzle and sometimes it's a very dominant piece and sometimes uh, we still have to counsel people about variability. And I think just, just the, the advance of this technology is allowing us to diagnose things a lot earlier. And in some ways we think of that knowledge as power, but it has such a profound effect on families at such an early stage that in some cases, I'm not sure that's always helpful to know that information in advance. And I think in some ways we're almost catching up with understanding how, you know, this very molecular information impacts the family. And, and, and I think it will be really interesting to see the sort of patient or family perspective on that. I think that's really interesting and sort of a parallel with, with your work, Francesca, because I know with, with families with genetic disorders, that's, they talk about the diagnostic odyssey, that you can be years trying to find a reason. Sometimes you may never find a genetic reason. Um, and then, you know, with genomic technology, we could actually say, OK, it's a fault in this gene. Maybe we can do something. Maybe we can't do something about it. And I guess with the, the women, particularly women and girls with autism, that you, you're sort of going through life not knowing what's wrong and trying to get to a, a diagnosis. Do you hear some? Some kind of chimes across what Harry was saying. Yes, I mean it, it's often there's often the sense um, that parents feel if they knew the cause, then they'd understand everything about it. But actually, knowing the cause tells you something about it. But for something like autism, well, if you think about something like Down syndrome, I mean, we know the cause, but it sadly hasn't led to greater understanding or um, you know better educational management and so on. Um, so. The biology is one thing, understanding um, at different levels, so understanding at the cognitive level, at the psychological level, at the family level, mm -hmm. um, I think is really important. And Kevin, you're, you're dealing in, in epidemiology, which I suppose mm -hmm. is the, the very study of causes. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have infectious diseases where it's like, yep, it's, it's that bug and we can name it and we can say that's a disease. But then we mm -hmm. also have many more other diseases where we can say things are causes or are mm -hmm. they risks? You know, how, do, how do you interpret mm -hmm. this idea of trying to find a diagnosis as an epidemiologist? Um, well, I think for the epidemiologists in the room, you'll probably agree that we tend not to look to one answer for anything because we realize it's the dynamic interactions between the individual factors, the family factors, the community, the social, the structural factors that end up de determining both an individual's health course, their life course, and their experiences of their health. So in my job, I'm not only interested in who has access to high quality diagnostic services and treatment services, but I also want to know about you know, their living conditions, you know, the housing and the home that they're living in, their connections to people in the community, the degree to which they are participating in society and have connections that are supportive and enabling for them to participate in health. All of those things together are key. And that's why as an epidemiologist, a key part of what we do is not just getting the numbers, but also understanding the context as well within which those numbers sit. So working with anthropologists, working with community experts to help to create that entire picture of what's driving health or ill health. So part of the, uh, the picture of health, we see a lot of different themes coming through in the book. We see themes of nature, we see themes of the natural world, mental well-being, art, food, family. I was wondering for each of you, if, if there is a particular thing that you do associate with, with health and well-being, um, if it's a particular theme, I don't know, Francesca, if there's something that you'd really sort of pin as being essential to, to health and well-being. Um, I think acceptance is incredibly important. So within autism, we know that, um, that non-autistic people make negative first impressions of autistic people. Um, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of autistic adults um, camouflage and mask their autism and, and lead what to them is not an authentic life and a life that puts their mental health under enormous strain. But we also know more optimistically that 
you can ameliorate those negative first impressions if people understand more about autism and if they know the person they're about to meet is autistic. So understanding and acceptance is incredibly important. Um, there are all sorts of things that go with autism that are incredibly difficult to live with, uh, epilepsy and sleep problems and gastrointestinal problems and so on. But there's also a lot that's difficult about living with autism that's very easy to change, that's to do with stigma and bullying and lack of acceptance and so on. So I think acceptance, understanding, genuine tolerance of difference um, is, is essential for, for health, for happiness. Thank you. Um, yeah, I completely agree with you. I think if I had to um, maybe add something slightly different, as I've grown up in medicine and moved away from a purely biomedical sort of training, I now appreciate the, the concept of well-being, which moves us beyond the physical health and the importance of connecting to nature. So I'll use that one. Um, you know, Part of what I do in London is to work with the mayor and work with local authorities to ensure that not only are we having clean air, but we have access to green spaces because of the power of connecting with nature to support our well-being and our health. And even blue spaces, being close to water uh, as being essential for us living in a city of 9 million people. And creating those opportunities for people to connect again with nature speaks to both our social side and the spiritual side to our well-being, which I think is important. And often the discussion on health locates itself within access to emergency departments, discharges from hospital, 111 call times, when actually what we probably need to be thinking about is how we connect with each other and how we connect with nature. You talking about access to blue spaces just give me flashbacks of going jogging along the canal. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and how about you for you, Harry? How do you sort of see this, this broader picture fitting in? Well, I guess maybe I'll go, go extreme the other way in terms of, of mm -hmm. biomedical, and that, you know, again, going back to these, you know, rare genetic conditions, many of these children will never breathe fresh air, they'll never make out a hospital, they'll never see a blue space. Yeah. And what holds us back is our fundamental understanding of science. Where you're telling parents, we don't even know what this gene does. 50% of people in the first consultation, more than 50%, regardless of background, will say, is there any research that we can be recruited to? And most of the time, the answer is no, because we just don't have a fundamental understanding of human biology. And without that baseline, uh, you know, you, it's very hard to give people hope. And this is, these are people being born on the doorstep of Imperial College. And there's, it's because these are rare disorders, it's very easy to sort of, to, to, to be, you know, just say, well, what, one in a million, what are we going to do? But at the same time, we invest a lot of money in these families just providing, and just, maybe doesn't do it justice, but, but, but providing, say, supportive care to keep people alive in intensive care, but we never actually want to get at the fundamental problem that's making this child unwell, which in my case will be a genetic problem. And so I guess that's one of the things I benefit from being in LMS as a researcher as well, is really, can we find a way to, to better studies, to, to use rare diseases, A, to understand them, but also, under, also to understand more about human biology. It's absolutely fascinating. I, I worked, um, I did my PhD in an institute that does developmental biology and cancer research and I've always been fascinated by the idea that like development is one cell going into many right and cancer is one cell going into many wrong and so these, these mm -hmm. connections that we can make with development. Um, but sort of skip away, Kevin, you, you talked a bit about connection and the connections between people and this book was put together during the pandemic and you know, we think of the, the people closest to us, you know, maybe they're our, our family or the people that we've chosen as our family. And during the pandemic, um, your family suddenly became like the people who were most likely <laughs> to give you, uh, certainly in the early phases, we were, I was terrified of seeing, mm -hmm. seeing my family. How, when you were working with the, in the COVID response, how was that sort of affecting the way you were thinking and, mm -hmm. and what we understand about these family connections? So understanding family both as a driver of uh, transmission of infection, but also family as a source of resilience and maintaining that balance was key during the pandemic. So very early on in our epidemiological studies, we were looking at the risk factors 
which resulted in increased risk of acquiring COVID and having severe disease. And as you can imagine, depending on the job that you were doing, depending on your household, the size of your household, whether you lived in overcrowded housing, that had a material impact on increasing your risk of acquiring COVID. And clearly overcrowded housing is not randomly distributed in the population. We see some ethnic groups, some socioeconomic groups, which have higher risk factors, higher, higher uh, prevalence of overcrowded homes. So that concept then of risk, even within the household in that first wave of the pandemic was actually really difficult for us to communicate to people. And even when you identify overcrowded households as a risk factor or families, big families, what is the intervention? What, you know, do you stay in a room? Do you lock the door? Do you ask people to leave? So it forced us to think about both how we communicate messages, but also how we, what are our asks of the public? Uh, in terms of uh, mitigating risk. On the other side, families proved to be a phenomenal uh, center or core of the response to the pandemic. For all of you who are parents of school-age kids, I wanna say thank you, because I know how hard it has been over the last three years, sending your kids to school, the risk of transmission of infection in school and coming back home, passing infection onto grandma. We had a lot of work to do with understanding risk and how we mitigate that risk within families. My final reflection on families, remember the pandemic also disrupted family relationships. How many of us were seeing mom and dad, brothers and sisters on Zoom calls because we couldn't meet? And that had a material impact on our physical health, on our mental well-being, especially for all the members of our family. So as we exit the pandemic, that importance of that unit, I think is, even stronger than ever, and certainly the work that we're doing and the messages that we're giving in the city. Francesca, I'm curious if, um, with some of the people that you work with, what the, the impact, you know, such, such a colossal disruption to all of us in our mental health and whether that was impacting the, the group of people that yeah. you work with. So, of course, we, like everyone else, jumped to it and did some, did some research uh, asking what to see people about the experiences of COVID. And um, one of the things that I found very interesting talking to um, neurodivergent people that I knew was that in the early days when the neurotypicals were all complaining about Zoom fatigue and saying, oh, I can't bear another you know, screen meeting. Even if I want to talk to that person, it's just too many screen meetings. When I talked to my autistic friends, they were saying, that's what in-person is like for us. That's how exhausting an in-person meeting. And even though I want to come and talk to you, it's just too much. I've done too much social. And there was clearly something, and a lot of them found it much more restful to be on screen because they could organize their sensory environment. There was sort of more explicit rules, you know, you put your hand up and things. Um, so there's clearly something about being together in person for most neurotypicals that is enriching and energizing, that um, is stripped away on screen. But that stripping away is actually quite peaceful for not every, every autistic person, but many autistic people. And it's very interesting. I'd really love to know what it is that we're missing um, from being together. So that was very, very interesting. And of course, you know, some autistic people found um, working from home, not having to commute, not having to be in noisy tube trains and things a, a benefit. But a lot of autistic people also found the fact that not everyone kept to the rules, that the rules sometimes changed, very confusing and frustrating and, and, and uh, anxiety provoking. And the idea that they were going to change again and have to go back into doing in-person social was a big, a big stressor. Um, I'd like to, to talk a bit more about the work that you do, because I know that art, you, you've shown us the, the beautiful artwork, the co-creation that you've done, the artwork and, and art is something that you find very important in your research. Can you tell us a bit more about the role of art in the work that you do? So I suppose it works in lots of different ways. So for many, many years, we've used things like drawing as a way to interrogate how autistic children's minds work differently from your typical kids' minds. Um, so for example, amazing eye for detail, it's much nicer to engage in an experiment where you ask a child to draw something um, than to you know, give them a much more structured test. And from so how somebody draws something, they draw a house and they start with each window pane, that gives you a pretty good indication of you know, an eye for detail, a preference for detail. So we've used drawing in our research, but we've also, I've also collaborated with artists um, to explore things that are on the boundaries. So we had a very nice project, which was about, um, about drawing and uh, 
the fact that in psychology, traditionally, you've had something called a draw the man, draw a man test, which has been used to rate children's development. So depending on how many details the child puts in their drawing, you get a higher score or a lower score. And this is so counter to any artist's idea about what makes a good drawing or what you would look for in a drawing. You know, if you think about those wonderful Picasso pictures that are you know, just one line and, and conjure up everything, but you get a terrible score and draw them out. You know. <laughs> so, so we had a sort of playful um, uh, collaboration about uh, turning drawing tests on their heads. And then that led to another collaboration about how we use visual materials in IQ tests. Um, and we pretend that they're culture fair. So traditionally, people have done things like you know, show a picture of, um, say, a, a bath without a plug hole, and you have to spot what's missing. And this is meant to be a fairer IQ test than you know, something that relies on what you've learned at school. But often people are completely blind to the assumed cultural knowledge. So it might be a bowling alley without a bowling ball. But if you've never been bowling, how could you possibly, possibly know? So uh, a lot of these tests have a fairly dubious history. And again, we were playing with uh, turning those into artistic experiences where there was no right answer. And it was divergent rather than convergent. So we've had a lot of fun. Kind of combining art and science. Okay, Harry, have you ever been involved in any art arty science projects? <laughs> Interesting. So I, I think I attended the very first picture of health. Uh, well, certainly meeting with Central St Martin's, and that was interesting. Sort of trying to communicate, you know, some of the you know pretty molecular science that we do, and and in a way that might you know inspire people to think about making works of art. I think it was probably easier for the people who say work in. MRI brain imaging and, and mental health that immediately gets, gets the juices flowing. But what I found quite interesting was, I guess I, I was asked to, to talk about genetic technologies and a lot of people have heard of, of gene editing and there's been lots of controversies about, about, you know, on the one hand, people can describe this as say, altering the human gene pool and germline editing. Uh, but if you put that same terminology in a separate way, uh, you could just say, well, what about if it's just turning a sequence back to the typical or normal sequence is 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 that allowed? Is that the same? And so, sort of those dualities between how we use language to describe something that could sound quite alarming versus something that that normalizes it more. So I, I tried with that, but I didn't inspire any great art. Unfortunately. <laughs> I think that's really sad because I, I used to work on tiny, tiny embryos, and I think they're some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. If you so in the very, very early stages of development, you basically get, when, when mummy and daddy love each other very much, you get like, you get an egg, a fertilized egg, sperm goes into the egg. And it's this kind of amazing, tra almost transparent ball just floating down the microscope. Then it divides in two and four. And it's, it's, it's genuinely one of the most, I think, incredible things I've ever seen. You start life as that. Every single human is just this little kind of collection of, of cells. Just, just, Blows, it blows my mind. I did want to, to lean into that, that kind of idea of talking about gene editing and, and things like fertility and family, because one of the things we think about, you know, we're thinking about family as part of health, and then also thinking about, you know, fertility and, and being able to have healthy children. How, what's your perspective on that as someone who works in, in developmental biology and, and in developmental disorders? Where, where are we as a society here? Yeah, but I think that's, you know, lots of interesting topics there. I mean, pick a question. <laughs> you know, for instance, in IVF, there's, you know, when we think about, you know, resources within the NHS, there's, there's people on the one side who, who don't think we should even be funding fertility treatment because we don't consider that part of health. That's, that's something different. I and mean, that's not my point of view, but, you know, people feel quite strongly about that. Even, you know, we do fund the IVF treatment or pre implantation genetic diagnosis. But if you've got a genetic condition that runs in your family and you already have a healthy child, that won't be funded. So it's all, you're only allowed to have one healthy child on the NHS. And again, that's about resources. And I think this is all being looked at again. I mean, these are obviously extremely expensive treatments. The diagnosis we're doing in these babies is extremely expensive. How do we weigh that up against what's happening in a &E's at the moment? Should I be dabbing about people's genomes when I could be, you know, in any carting someone in right now? So I think there's, you know, we've got so much power now and in terms of the technologies and should we be driving forwards to be pushing the boundaries? 
at a point where the very basics in NHS at the moment are essentially crumbling. It's pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. Do you have a perspective on this as well, Kevin? On which aspect? <laughs> Pick one. <laughs> um, so I'll speak to the challenges of, of prioritization uh, at the moment and resource allocation. I think, you know, there are no right or wrong answers. And even as we go through this really challenging time, rather than being seduced into thinking one is better than the other, or we should be only focusing on one versus the other. Certainly from my perspective as, as the public health director for the city, I continually argue for a balanced portfolio of investment because we will never treat our way out of the crisis that we're seeing and experiencing now. We need to prevent, we need to take care of care, and we need to ensure we have really great research looking at different populations on different issues to get beyond this. So I think I was just sort of reflecting on the last thing you said about just allocated resources and, and how we navigate that space. Thank you. I'm going to throw it open to the floor. If anyone has uh, a question, please do pop your hand up. And uh, yes. You struck a chord when you were talking about nature. such a diverse city. Yeah, that's a great question. And if I had my director of public health colleagues here, they'd tell you some of the fantastic initiatives across the city to encourage people to reconnect with nature. And you're absolutely right. Depending on your experience, your social upbringing, the experiences and exposure you had as a child, as a school child, then your connection to an appreciation of nature can be vastly different. And for many of our inner city urban kids for whom the journey from home to school to the high street and back home can often be devoid of any access to green or blue spaces. We've worked with schools to connect people to um, gardening, city farms, visiting and traveling outside of the city to connect with nature, to get experience with hiking and trekking and, and the sort of outdoor sports and activities. And that's a key part of the development of our young people in the city. Similarly, as people get older, to ensure that we continue to invest in green and blue spaces in the city. So I do a lot of work with the planners and regeneration, regeneration experts across the city. So all of the new developments that we see developing across London, we ensure in their planning applications that we're not just increasing the density of London, but we're actively designing in opportunities to connect with nature as well. And that's an important part of health for the city. Thank you. Um, there's a question about Aldo. Yeah. Oh, it's very traditional way of life. Who wants to take that first? Kevin? Shall I jump in? I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and this, I hope, will be one of my own legacies as I sort of traverse my own career, that we have got to integrate the outcome measures that we're looking for and the measures that we value when we're trying to measure and understand health. And for too often, I think the paradigm, especially in Western medicine, has been dominated by clinical outcomes, biomedical markers, et cetera. And now, again, post-pandemic, we probably have a broader understanding of the power of connection, the power of um, you know, our social, us as social beings. And that I hope that the success that we measure will not just be on improvement in clinical outcomes, but is that person better adjusted? Are they better connected? Do they feel happier? 
as measures that we also value as well. I think we have a way to go, but I think you're right on the money with this, that what gets measures, what gets measured gets done, what gets measured influences policy, and we need to broaden the metrics that we're using. So completely agree. Yes, really interesting. So we've done quite a lot of work on aging in autism, which is a very under-researched field. And the traditional measures of good outcome are living independently, having a job, et cetera. And we really find that that doesn't capture at all quality of life and well-being and satisfaction with life. So we have a whole sort of qualitative strand of work running alongside these traditional tick boxes of, you know, have you got a job, et cetera. Um, so, yes, really, really important. And one of the problems that, that in general we see in, in neurodevelopmental conditions is the lack of connect between different departments or different life phases, who's spending the money versus who's saving the money. Yeah. Because we know that if you don't invest in children's well-being and good education, they will have mental health crises later on. They won't be employed. Mm -hmm. But it's not always that the people in education will see the money back. It might be that the people who are, you know, looking at, at employment see the money back. So the spend and the gain are in different places, and I don't know what one does about that. You have a much better idea, I'm sure. Yeah, but it's a real challenge. Um, you know, we disinvest in early intervention, adult peril as a society. And I think um, as we have seen over the past decade, I think, where we've had a contraction economically in the investment in this area, to me, it's not a surprise necessarily that we're seeing some of the challenges now in terms of increasing demands on children and young people's mental health services. Um, the real challenges that we're seeing uh, both within the education as well as in the economic sector as well. So uh, yes, understanding the metrics, understanding funding, and how they play out across the lab course is key. Yeah. Harry, from, from your perspective, um, working with developmental disorders, you sort of touched a bit on this earlier. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I guess, I just thought of a story when you asked that question. So I, uh, I wanted to go and assess a child in pediatric intensive care, so bigger kids, so the kids are maybe four or five, and there were six children in intensive care when I walked in, one I was seeing. The other five, I diagnosed when they were neonates, and they, they all had severe developmental disorders, which meant they were going to die at some point, months or years, probably never going to walk or talk. And they were all in intensive care with flu or other viral infections. And that seemed just, and they were getting amazing care. But I'm not sure how much, you know, it's very easy to spend money in that way. A million, that, that's probably millions of pounds in one ward now what what value has been got there could the money be better spent in research trying to think about early interventions in some of those disorders or in actually talking to those families before their child is admitted with a severe infection do they even want to go into intensive care and again I, i'm not sure what the right answer is but we're trying to quantify this at the moment just how much money we spend in the, in the short lives of these ch ch children, and is that money being best spent? Uh, and I don't know. I don't know the answers to that. I don't know if that really answers your question at all. It's very impressive, Come Diana. Um, any other questions? Another question. Um, <laughs> so should, should we have more compulsory PE? <laughs> yes, we should. <laughs> I hated PE. <laughs> I know, so did I. But you know, now that I'm past that age, I can look back. I was made to play netball if I've been allowed to do something else. <laughs> yeah. You know, it is the million-dollar question, isn't it? Because we have 
although they're a captive audience in schools, depending on who you're speaking to, there's a limited amount of time in which to get the children to do a range of things. You know, mm -hmm. mathematics is now the sort of flavor du jour. Um, and there are going to be trade-offs. So, and clearly the pendulum has swung towards academic accomplishments and achievements. And that's squeezing out the things within the curriculum, which create, some have said, more rounded individuals and perhaps more healthy individuals as well. So getting that balance right is key. Uh, I'm not an educationalist, but I am a public health uh, specialist. And so what we do with schools is to ensure we have the evidence on where to invest the time of the schools and, and students in order to get the greatest health gain. So things like the daily mile for primary school kids, having time for ch children to have outdoor activities, activities to connect, build social competence. These are all things that we promote for our schools. So I'm glad you asked. Yeah. I can't much um i mean i think i will remind everyone that like we, we talk a lot about science and research and we say that it's not political um it is political because the people in charge make the policies you know, this is a, a government funded institution um we have a say in who our government are and um and the policies that they make so i would always encourage people to look at science policies and, and vote for parties that promise to support research turn the uk back into a science superpower we are very good at it we can do incredible things with research, incredible research going on in this building, and we can make a real difference to health now and in the future. Um, I will thank you very kindly for your attention. I'd really like a huge round of applause for our panel. I'd like to, uh, like to thank all our contributors. I'd like to thank the organizers of this evening, the amazing team, and Lindsay as well, and uh, and Patrick on, on the sound and visions. Please do pick up your copy of the book, take it home, read it, share it, do tweet or post on social media, hashtag picture of health. And uh, thank you very much. There's more time, a bit more time for mingling and looking at the exhibition, but thank you very much for coming.